Okay, thanks for coming today. There's just been so many um, um, new things coming out from NIH recently, in particular, about grant get deadlines and requirements that I thought maybe, yeah, um, and also some university changes. So I just, just kind of decided to lump them all together and, and, and do it. Um, in fact, I have like nine, eight, eight areas of update today. We're going to talk about the Freedom of Information Act, the Student Researchers in Conflict of Interest Disclosure, Student Registration on ERA Commons, Registration of Clinical Trials with clinicaltrials.gov, NIH New Dissemination Policy, um, new NIH Biosketch, some proposed new reviewer checklists that they're going to use for reviewers, um, quick reminder about public access policies, and then just a little bit about some uh, upcoming uh, programming. Um, so, right, getting right into it. By the way, this is being um, uh, taped and it will be available for people, the slides and, and the audio. So if you know people who aren't here who, who want to know about it. Okay. So, the Freedom of Information Act, the new policy that just came out, this applies to when <clears throat> you receive an email from NIH that says someone has requested your grant. This is when they've been funded and we'll receive an email that says someone has requested it. And we normally get a chance to take out proprietary information, things that you think would, um, by sharing that you, it's an unfair advantage to someone else or that you're choosing to keep private for right now. I've had, I've requested grants where I, three-fourths of it were blacked out, okay? And I've requested them where, they automatically take out budget pages stuff like that, you know. And I've had someone who's been nuts, so it, it depends on what that is. The, the point I want to make about the policy here is a new one coming from within CASE, where they're saying that if you get such a request from NIH that the, um, uh, the general counsel's office, the top lawyer, uh, would like us to contact their office before we release our grants. Okay. Now, I have to tell you, they're going to be released anyway. Um, because of the um, because of the Freedom of Information Act, um, the issue is um, how much you want to black out in addition to what NIH thought they would black out. All right. Um, so um, anyway, so this is a new step. Things might not happen as fast as a, in, in the, as, as fast. This also will affect you when you're on the on the requesting side when you request one. It may take a little bit longer. I just want to share with you some personal experience that I've had with this um, for some of you who haven't done it, okay? Um, a couple of times, you know, I would hear about a colleague who got a cool grant funded and then I would write and ask for it because Freedom of Information Act, you know. And the feedback I got from my colleagues is, why don't you just ask me for it, Shirley? We're friends, all right? So people are kind of sensitive to have NIH be the middle person when they're a friend of yours and they think you really should just ask for it. You know? So I just, it's happened to me a couple times, so now I just assess if I think they're my friends, I just say, would you feel comfortable sharing it? And they, they seem more comfortable with that than this anonymous thing. So, so um, now, you know, how that applies to this policy about what you're sharing and whatnot is up to you. Of course, the case policy is they want to protect uh, licensing rights. <coughs> and that, that's what they're most interested in, that you're not giving away something that could be licensed. Questions about somebody requests your grant, do you know who it is? Or do they yes. just say yes. there's been a request? Oh. Yes. Yes. You know who it is, what university they're from, and what their name is. Oh. And that's why people say. Mm -hmm. Right. In the very beginning, I didn't understand this, and I actually told a colleague I wasn't comfortable sharing it, mm -hmm. and um, then I got the request from NIH. <laughs> 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 so, now I kind of understand, but you know, in the beginning when someone just said, send me your whole grant, and I would get my first one, I would get it. But anyway, no. Okay, conflict of interest disclosures. We're used to that as faculty. We have to do one every year. Okay. 
the, the newest thing that's come up, and this happened to Carol Muse also brought it to my attention, and then I was told this has been on the books for a very long time, and that evidently we haven't been using it, or at least many of us had not been using it. Excuse me. And it had not been required. It had not been required. No, right? I mean, I had three weeks before I was told that my husband made a contest of this Yeah, but ORA says it's been on the books for years as required. Yeah, they weren't stopping them, okay. And hers got stopped at the IRB, who said your students on this grad don't have, um, you, know, you know how we're always adding students, you have to add them and that sort of thing. Now we have to make sure that they have a signed um, conflict of interest disclosure. And we go for a higher research assistant. Yeah. Even the 501. Even the 501. Even the 501. And it's, it's, you know, it's just something we can easily add into like the manager's you know, you do the conflict of interest too, and so, you know, three minutes. So, yeah, so it means when you train, when you put someone on, it's crack training, okay, maybe HIPAA training, now it's conflict of interest disclosure form. It's done online. Um, um, they, they assure me that it will be very simple for students. I'm, we'll, we'll see how that is, because that language is kind of unique to that field, all right? And also, some of our students are not, they're not just young undergrads, you know, they're older people who are married to someone who may be on a board, okay, uh, who may well be. So it may not be just say, no, I have none. Um, because if we're going to have them fill it out, we should train them appropriately that they really read it and they uh, adequately assess any pop possible ones. So we don't want them just going in and saying no to everything, you know, off the bat without reading and understanding the idea of conflict of interest. So, is this UH IRB or the case? It's the case Western Reserve. So, oh, okay. when I visit the UH IRB, I also have to have the register. Is it case spider web system or whatever it is now, conflict of interest, and those people seem to talk to each other in some way? I don't know. I actually have a call in to fill COLA about the articulation and the requirements. I, I usually use UH. I've never been stopped, and I, and I, I must add a student a month, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, coming in and out, and high school students, you know, just all, all kinds. Um, so, um, it's, I've never been asked, and, and I'm, I'm pretty clear they're not doing conflict of interest. I've never asked them. So, just so you know, certainly case requires it. I'm going to check now about UH to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I, I was hoping to get a response by today. This is a reminder about if you have a student who's participating on an NIH funded grant, okay, that they have to be registered in ERA Thomas. And they're going to stop our progress reports, okay, um, now if we don't have that done. I think, I think the, this is part of this trying to understand who's involved in research, who are the research uh, workforce um, that are out there, and this is one way of tracking them. Okay, because if you fill out ERA comments, if you fill out the personal information, it asks you about your education and level and that sort of thing. So I think this is all part of trying to find out who who is the um, research workforce that's out there. Sure. And who would you pay? Pardon? Pay people? Oh, or oh, no, no. Paid or volunteer. Yeah, NIH, you know, doesn't care who gets money. It's that you're participating, you're having access, you're contributing, you know, that, that sort of thing. So would that be another step in the 503 process? Or are they just getting the ERA funding? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I didn't know uh, how many are working on NIH grants or, or not. Um, we, I just came from a meeting across campus and we talked about putting together a tickler list mm -hmm. for people when someone new comes on, okay, what are all the things that you need to do to make it easier for, for the people. And, you know, and we're talking about human subjects, people who are doing animals, there's another whole thing for them. Mm -hmm. And that might also could be different at, at UH, you know, in terms of what they have in terms of HIPAA training. Because so case doesn't This is a reminder about 
registration at clinicaltrials.gov if you're doing a clinical trial. And first of all, this post, this just came out last week. Um, well, they've had registering for some time, but they've been emb embellishing it. And so last week, they came out with um, a new <coughs> expanded definition of what a clinical trial is. And essentially, it's everything we would do that we would call an intervention study. Um, a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions um, to evaluate the effects of those interventions on health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. The actual definition has a little bit more detail of um, what an intervention is. It's anything that manipulates anything, okay? Um, and uh, a little bit more about what bio, health-related bio, uh, medical or behavioral outcomes are, but it would pretty much fall into that definition. So the proposed policy that they have out now for a very short response time, but my experience is they put these out and they come out fast afterwards. So um, is that the st your study must be registered by 21 days after the first subject is entered. Right? And then you have to then put in um, completion date uh, no later than one year after the completion date. And this is what is a little bit strange for us. Completion date is defined as the date that the final subject was examined or received an intervention for the purpose of final data collection of the primary outcome. So it's, it's not holding it to you do secondary analysis. It's not at the end point that the, says the grant ends. It's when your last subject is enrolled and assessed, that final assessment. Okay. I'm trying to go back and finish some from trials that I've had before because I, um, I went and tried to clean up my act. You know. And um, I had a hard time trying to figure out the date of the last subject. I mean, I, I can do it, but it's going through 400, you know, things trying to find that last subject. So again, so when you think of clinicaltrials.com, it's registering the upfront your trial. And, uh, and doing it within the time slot that they have, and it's also putting the results up. And the actual proposed policy that they have um, has some pretty tough sanctions if you don't. If you don't um, um, put in your completion date, uh, they won't accept your final report, they won't, um, they threaten you about no more NIH grants, you know, there's a, a lot of things. And the same thing they, they said about the 21 days after the first subject, if you don't put that in, they won't accept your first report. They may stop. They, they said they may stop funds on it. So, so there's a lot of def, a lot of statements in there about the definition of clinical trial that that includes pilot data. All right. So if you do a pilot on NIH dollars, I'm thinking of the those of you in the um, T30, um, and you're doing a thing, you you have a clinical trial under there. I don't know what you're going to put in for a number and stuff like that, so we may have to work, work that out. Questions on the reporting analysis? Again, I think this is their wanting to know more about clinical trials as they're going on. This is moving toward public reporting of results um, and doing it fast okay, uh, for people. But I think that's different, you know, when we're thinking about well, Sometimes we ask for a carryover year, we're doing analysis or secondary stuff. That's not what they're, uh, you know, that's not what they consider the completion date is when the last subject is assessed. I know it sounds strange, but I can clear what a clinical trial is, but we were instructed when we started our description of NIH study to register our study at that clinical trial. So our study is registered there. So does that mean I need to put a final recording? If you're registered, I would because, you know, they don't like half. Yeah. If you're registered, I would do that. Well, I would at least put that date in, you know, yeah. um, what we're doing data right now. Um, as I said, I think they're moving toward the public reporting, getting things up fast, following trials. They're trying to get a better system for them figuring out who never publishes. You know, if you go in there, they want eventually the articles are connected to that trial. Um, they want to create a database that we could all 
our query, you know, in my area with some keywords, what are the current trials that are going on? So I don't replicate them, okay? Or I want to link up with them, or, you know, so it, it becomes a database for, for all of us to use as well. It's a lot of work. You put in, I, how did you do it? Because it asked about your arms. <laughs> yeah, I think we put down a okay. mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I'm moving through pretty fast. The new NIH biosketch. All right. Good news, okay? Good. Yesterday they changed the date from January 25th to May, I think it's May 25th. Oh, yay. <laughs> because for all the people who had grants going in in February, these things, because it said after, after January 25th. Um, and you know, I would I wasn't worried so much about the people in this room or those putting getting yours. It's all your collaborators on sketches and getting them to switch over and build the things that are so I have a handout for you um, that kind of walks you through um, the the new requirements. And so when you look at that front page, you see there's the A B C Normally, there's the ABCD um, section. I think I have it on the next page here. There's the personal statement. Then there's positions and honors. A new section I'll talk about called contributions to science. And then a research support, which is unchanged. So we have two sections unchanged and two that are changed. Um, so this is now May. I didn't change it this morning when I came in. <laughs> but that's good news for us. Um, from uh, the size of the thing changed from four pages max to five pages, maximum now. Okay. The biggest change is that your pub a publications list is linked to this thing called my bibliography. All right. So this is the task at hand now between now and May. Okay. Um, we need if you haven't started, we need to start building a my bibliography page. Um, uh, for, every, for everyone. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk primarily here about faculty, okay, um, bio sketches. If you're a postdoc, if you're applying for a postdoc position or something else, there's two of them. Maybe it's pre-doc, okay. Um, the bio, so training, training grants, those bio sketches look different. So just remember, if you're working with someone um, um, uh, who's, who's on the training programs, their bio sketches that they included look different than the faculty. They, they put in more tra um, training activities, um, even courses, and that sort of thing. Um, go in there, so. so I'm going to primarily talk about the faculty. Um, and I put this for those of you who want to eventually look up this, the, these slides and find out how to do it. But we'll talk more about that here. So the changes to the personal statement, okay. And your personal statement now, um, before we were highlighting our qualifications to contribute to this project, we were already doing that. Now you can include up to four publications, okay. They need to be from my bibliography linked, okay, uh, for that, um, and put in there. And so I give you, I think of the, the last couple pages that you have there are the sampling ones. If you want to refer to, um, that you see the person has three publications at the end. Uh, where the, that they put in. So when you say they're linked, I mean, well, there has to be a link. They, no, no. They, they have to be included in your my bibliography. Okay. Later on, they'll actually be a linked part of okay. it. And, and that's a separate document somewhere else. My, bibli yeah, my bibliography is sitting in a, a National Library of Medicine database, and this is their way now of tracking for all of us what we put out, linked to a, a grant, linked to your pubs, linked to um, a lot of things. And it's not necessarily that. Oh, yeah. I have pig research online. Um, <laughs> and it's already out there. Part, it's yeah, part of it. Yeah. They tried to have to start one. Yeah. yeah. When you go in with your name, you'll see whether they started one for you or not. Okay. If you have a common name like Douglas or Moore, it, it, there's stuff there. And 
Lord knows what I have on mine. Um, um, so this is what you go in. I'll talk about how to how to do that in just a moment. Okay. Um, is it um, one other question? Is it expected that you put at least a couple of cups with your personal space, or is it entirely optional? I think it's all optional. I, but I think what they want is that you're trying to promote yourself as having some qualifications for a role, and so you know the better qualified people will have some link. There's some uh, pub, and so they want you. That's it's like hard evidence, if you will. So do I think the most engaging applications will happen? Um, you know, I did have personal experience with this. I led a study section that was one of two last fall where we were piloting these, so they were required to put them in. The reviewers did not like them at all. And, and like three days later, policy came <laughs> So, so much for our intellect for that yeah, as our pilot. Um, uh, and I can share later a little bit about their attempts to, to uh, understand them and everything. You also have a chance there to describe why there's a gap in your pro productivity or career to date. Right? Um, I don't know if I understand yeah, those. Yeah, here in the 2005, my career was disrupted due to family obligations. However, I made up for that by working twice as hard. <laughs> <laughs> So, but anyway, just so you know, there's a, there is a way now to say if something extenuating happens in your life, you would like to see that. A lot of these changes were put in um, supposedly to help early career investigators. Okay. We were concerned in the room and study section that it wasn't necessarily supporting them okay, because they didn't have very long sections and the experienced people had long sections. You had to go to five pages. And so some people took the first page was nothing but personal statement, page and a half. So, yes. No changes on the positions and honors sections. And now the pub section has been removed. Okay. And in its place is called something called contributions to science. Right. And this is a brief narrative. Um, of your top five contributions, of up to your top five contributions to science. So this means sitting and saying, I'm Jacqueline, I've done instrument development, you know, I've developed, I've, um, you know, developed a theory and application to this. I, you know, so you would, would say, kind of sit back and, and what, what those were. Um, um, whoops. Sorry. But Shirley, am I correct? This, this is going to be tailored, so if I'm in on a grant that's on critical care, my contributions to science may look different than if I'm on an end of life grant. Definitely your personal statement should differ, and that's, that's to this project. Okay. Oh, okay. So okay, now this one is to science, but my guess is you're probably smart to make sure you highlight, I put my first yeah. one being this project. Yeah. Um, I'd be careful about maybe having a science area that's so far away that it actually detracts if I only have three or four. Um, you know, as all grant writing, there's a little bit of an art um, you know, to it. Um, so up to five contributions, followed by four pubs representing that contribution. Okay. Um, and each of these areas, including the four pubs, um, is about a half, can be up to a half a page, they're suggesting. Now, I don't think anybody's measuring exactly, but the yeah, idea they're trying to give you a feel. So you can see how this gets to five pages faster, which doesn't help reviewers. You know, I, I, we're trying to try that. I'm really learning that much more about the person. And again, there's some feeling among our group when we were using it that it favored the senior people, um, you know, versus early career people. Um, so we just said, you know, you do all the early career people together and you have that as your framework. Um, then you follow that at the end of these five areas of up to five with a half a page each or so with a UR link to your My Bibliography. So 
So that's what you built that. So then reviewers will click on that and see your goals listed across. Now, theoretically, all you have to have in my bibliography is pubs off of NIH grants. Okay. But most of us have you know, other things that are supporting. Uh, they don't have to be all um, data-based. Okay. So there is still, except book chapters, books, that sort of thing. And you see on the example there where they have the URL. Mm -hmm. So just quickly, um, personal statement now, you can include a list of four pubs that highlight this contribution to this project. You have a chance to speak to any gaps in your productivity. This new section, no more list of your 15. Now uh, the brief narratives, five areas of contribution, um, followed by four pubs in each one, and then the URL. So the real work here is um, getting, you know, getting the my bib done, and then giving some thought for yourself. You know, it's no more just pulling the old, the old one out and updating it, you know, or changing a few pubs for this particular grant or something like that. Um, and I, I think we uh, all need to stop and kind of think, and probably do a fun exercise. Okay. Um, so what do you need to do this? You need an ERA Commons uh, NIH login. I'm assuming most people have a one. You need to complete the personal profile and e e ERA Commons. You need to populate um, the uh, my bibliography. Um, I didn't know what NCBI, National Center for Bibliographic Information. Um, um, now you can get to my bibliography from ER Commons, although it's a few clicks to get there. More direct, uh, you can get there through PubMed, okay? Or this is the direct um, link. You have to use your um, e, um, ERA Commons. Um, email or, or address to get into this and it then will get you to your your bibliography. Oh, at the very end, and there's a pretty big flashing signs at you, you have to make this public. If this is private space, okay? so when you finish, like most of, I think most of us should probably just keep it public all the time. Okay? But you, it's private right now, that's why you have to do everything into it there. But at the very end, so that people can see it on your grant, you need to make sure that public is on. So Shirley, did you finish yours? Pardon? Did you finish when you and I talked to or we were both starting? I was just curious. No. I have 130 pubs. And the work to see what's there versus what I think I have. So there's there's you can delete things that are in error, I assume. Things that aren't there. Yeah. Go back and see if that's an error on your CV about that date. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's little things that add up over the years. And, uh, what I found frustrating was in trying to generate the bio sketch through the system. You know, I think one of the options is you can link through your ERA Commons. And I thought, well, that's great because they've got my bio sketch, so why don't I just upload all of that stuff? According to that, I have one job, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, bits and pieces got uploaded, but not all of it. And I don't I'm have not using it to build my yeah. bio sketch. I, I, I didn't go into that. Oh, so you just retyped everything? Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I'm gonna do. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Well, well, you already have your old bio sketch. You don't have to right. create a bio sketch there. You only have to have a my bibliography. That's all you need to have. And so, because my bio sketch is going to change, you know. So I thought, you know, we'll just use, my view was I was going to just use the current system we have, but I would make sure now that I have the URL, I'll go in and do the URL to link into my bibliography, and then I'll make, you know, change the pubs and the usual things that we changed already about the personal statement. So you're, you, you retype all your jobs and your positions and the well, they're already typed. And you're talking about the personal profile? Yeah, no, no. When I have to generate the bio sketch for this stuff, yeah, for this, this stuff, yeah. you 
because well, like, I never try. I don't. I don't want to generate a, a bio sketch from that nature. Right. Okay, I got it. Doesn't mean I shouldn't. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I started with the with the old one. Right, right. You know, right, 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 right. And then I just cut paste into a new session. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can cut it from your. Well, the front of the always going to be a word that I can write. Really? It's always going to be a word that I can That's what I'm asking. Yeah. What do you can yeah. cut the page from, yeah. the, from yeah. the file and put it there. Jacqueline, when you did this, I did all in. My bibliography is pulled in from public. Yes. Or oh. you can type in. Okay. So right, but it, it'll list you know, those there, okay. and then you can delete okay. things that aren't yeah. yours. Okay. And then if there's not stuff that's yours that should be on there, then you can say you want to manually enter it, and then you have to type in. It reminds me of the FAS system, you know, the journal name and this and that kind of stuff. Um, and um, But I was just curious, so the institution and location, not that I have any honors or awards, but, you know, that's one of those other sections. So do, when you built it from, oh, right, positions and employment, so that is on the bio sketch. So you... You just retyped all of that from your old bio sketch? I started with my old one. You started with our old one. That's what was already there. We started with our old one. And then we didn't worry about what showed and everything except for my video. Okay. I got it. So I'm trying to work within the system, and you're saying, what's wrong with the old bio sketch? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand if you're saying. No, but, never do well, it, so but you don't have to. I'm just surprised that I'm the one that's trying to work with the system. <laughs> <laughs> the system. I can't believe it. Well, you were a real early adopter. Yeah, yeah. And Jack um, Bond was first. Did you do this? Um, no. no. Becky Dara was in that round where you, it was required for the pilot and stuff. So she has done a lot. And then I think Jacqueline was that. I think it's not that so you can see now what they're trying to do is they're going to be able to trace a pub to an NIH grant eventually, be able to see if you acknowledged appropriately, and I think they're going to be really bugging us. And I think they've decided not to use our acknowledgments anymore to track the pubs coming out and use them in this one way, okay. uh, particularly on clinical trials where they're trying to connect the trial, the results, the acknowledgments, you know, and the pubs all in one thing. So they're building the, the big database. So I just this is not new, but I just want to remind people because I know we have laggers um, and I'm kind of been a, close to a lagger on this, is getting the PMC ID numbers. Right? And this is done when I think it's easier now because most of the journals when you sign off it says you give us permission to assign the number to you. Okay. But the thing that's really important now is um, NIH is not accepting progress reports and they're close to not accepting grants if we don't have the PMC ID numbers on it. So it's no more, you know, just I got to some and didn't get to others. When you now, say accepting grants, that's the PMC ID, what do you mean? The references? Uh, like now it'll be in, no, no, no. It'll be in your, in my bibliography. You're going to have to have, yeah. Well, anybody could be anybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, I just received a grant back that um, reviewed that wasn't particularly good. And a couple of those people said that there were, on my bio sketch, there were some uh, manuscripts that didn't have PMC numbers. Julie, do you think either the Hirsch people or the Center for Research can help folks, you know? Rather than having to do it ourselves, can we do that? Well, there's no for sure right now. So, yes. Okay. We had a long discussion about my bibliography and PMC ID and um, them actually doing some of the work. The problem is they can't get your PMC and PMC ID number for you. Okay. To get it, you mean they can't get it assigned? Yeah. Right, because you have to log in with your. You have to get yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, what they've said, if you want to bring your stuff up and sit next to them for a half hour, they'll click all the buttons 
and help you do it. And so that that's that's pretty good. Um, so because I was worried, especially when we had the January 25th date, I was particularly worried both about PMCID numbers and the my bibliography. So they are geared up, okay, um, to help you build uh, build those. Are these studies funded during your postdoc? Government funds. If it's government post But still after a certain year. Yeah, 2007? Seven or eight. And there is a way, if it's in progress, there is the, there is a way to say in progress. And that's supposed to be accepted. But you know, if you have one that was published in 2000, this is how mine were, 2010, and I have in progress, they're not so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They, I mean, they, they, they were right on. Just what I did, as any I didn't have that was going on, I just wrote in progress. You know, and I thought you weren't in progress. Um, the pro proposed reviewer's checklist. Okay. I share this with you. Um, this is NIH says that all reviewers already have, we're supposed to rate grants on experimental design, minimizing bias, and interpretation of results. This is more detailed information to reviewers about what to look for under each of those categories. This has not been adopted yet, but it's, uh, it was, they piloted this in my section as well, and, um, and we actually had a lot of comments to change it, so I, I don't wording and that sort of thing. Um, and also, it doesn't say that it's only for clinical trials, but when you read it, that's clearly for an intervention study. Right? Uh, there are a lot of descriptive stuff or large database analysis and that that it would not have applied to. So we said we thought they needed to kind of sort that out for reviewers. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, discuss it today, but I just want, I, it's kind of early stuff. I think this is, if you read it, it's good science. But we're all looking for that little checklist, you know, did I include this and that. So I give it to you more as a, a quick check. I actually like their words of minimizing bias when they're talking about um, masking and method of randomization and those kind of things. They're looking for sources of, of bias or not. I mean, I thought it was a nice way to put that. The um, most controversial thing and it's the um, first thing about validation. Second one. Is that the second one? Second one. Indicate mm -hmm. if there will be an independent validation or replication of the study findings. Okay. Of course, we didn't have anybody who did that in the grant that we had. But the, um, I don't know who it was, but some high guy at NIH came back to our home session and tried to use these two things so he could hear our discussion. And he said that that's one of the most important things they want to change is people who are doing pilot studies, putting that work in, was never validated by anybody else, and then NIH funds, you know, a $10 million whole big multi-site trial based on what turns out to be non-replicable pilot data. So, his discussion to us was the ideal grant, pass it on, would be one where you would have your pilot data in there and say this was independently validated by da da da. Meaning literally someone would someone else your experimental procedures and see if they got the same results. Somebody would analyze, I think analyze your data. Go into your database, analyze it and see if they got the same findings. I've been given this some thought. You know, we do have multiple statisticians here. You know. um, it would depend, you know, it takes some time to do. Um, it's hard enough to get one statistician. <laughs> <laughs> but I could see where um, uh, a second one doing now, uh, now, I have a natural, and a few of you, others of you do here too. I have a natural thing come up where, where Nikita Gordon did the analysis, you know, I didn't write it up as fast as I should, I'm, un I'm uncomfortable now interpreting everything she wrote, and so I'm having it done again, okay. and I actually finished that and 
came up with this gag finding, you know, you know, which was like, oh, uh, on that. So um, even though they use some different methods of replacing missing data, you know, every statistician has their little thing on that. But it tells me it's pretty robust. I need that. So now when I write the next grant and I use those findings, I'm going to put them on there, you know, by that. But so I'm just I'm laying it out there as, as thoughts for you guys to think about. But I think the ideal grant would have it on your on your pilot data, okay? And then in your methods and your stat section and your methods section, you would say how you plan, which is what they hear here, plan for an independent validation or replication. Okay. You know, the Anyway, um, this is the reviewer checklist. Give some thought to this idea of validating. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. It's possible there may even be letters in the, in the future that come from a second statistician mm -hmm. saying, I truly, this was an independent, I wanted part of the original right. team, right. I was brought in, and mm -hmm. I started at this point to look at these data. Was there any discussion about the next item on here to try to plan to ensure robustness and reproducibility of all experimental data? Um, yeah, actually, that was another one um, that uh, came up. And some people um, applied that to the idea of uh, uptake and dissemination and scalability. And some people saw that as um, uh, uh, something closer to the uh, validation kind of idea. But we gave them some feedback about the vagueness. Many people thought that related to scalability and uptake. Okay, so um, my last thing here, I just wanted to let you know some plans that we have. As you know, Sarah Douglas is now the assistant director of the, of, of the research with me, and um, it's fun to have a colleague. <laughs> uh, but you know, she's even worse than I am. She's not without ideas all the time. <laughs> so, um, but the exciting thing is, and, and we've been getting feedback. You know, the dean has been meeting with groups of people about what some of your research needs are and gaps. And so, uh, one of the big things we're working on is post-award assistance, doing a series of um, Things about helping people, how to set up their accounts, you know, what are, you know, you know, the templates for your first year award, the regulatory binder, and putting that all together, and that sort of thing. So Sarah is going to uh, lead a session on January 26th um, um, on regulatory binders, what needs to be in there. I always say from the very beginning, you know, those audits um, are random. <laughs> It's not because you did something wrong, you just could be chosen. And the more research you do, the more often your name comes up. Um, so consider yourself uh, very ripe uh, for an audit. 
And it's nice from the very beginning, you know, to have that thing kind of in place and not have to be scrambling for old things to uh, build, build a good regu um, regulatory binder. Um, innovative question sessions. This is uh, a series that I'm um, going to lead using our five focus research areas. I'm going to use a model that um, I learned um, at NINR where they brought people together in a focused area of research and everybody had to come with a, what they thought was an innovative question or where the edge of the science was okay, for that field. And then the whole group discussed everybody's question. Okay. And so I thought we would take our five areas. I would send out a little note okay, that would explain what you should bring out, how to pull whatever out of this cup given from NINR to that session. The nice thing about it, it creates a, a, a feeling among the group, okay, a shared feeling about where the edge is, possible collaborations uh, for, for that. Um, I think it could move us closer to common data elements um, uh, and that sort of thing when we go to, um, to our measures. So those are designed to be fun science talks. Right? Um, <clears throat> Um, some, some that we're just going to call research or workshops, they're not necessarily post-award or these science talks, but they will be around, around a particular important issue um, like contemporary data management. And that has to do with everything from security, uh, the latest security um, rules for it, um, the latest best practices for building databases and keeping them secure, that sort of thing. Use of kind of common data elements is another one I thought that we might want to spend some time um, looking at, um, and we could probably create a list and we'll be querying people about other things to add to this list. Um, my last communication has to do about being a research PI at local hospitals. Okay? Um, as you know, most of the time when we go in, we need to have someone there be the, be the PI. Uh, sometimes that we're given the luxury of a, of a responsible investigator, but mostly not right now. Um, mostly it's right now it's you just give, you know, the project you have. That's not, never sat well with me because I feel, and I said I'm the PI, I don't want anyone else having their name down as the PI from this. And my experience also is that, you know, all the IRB materials and feedback go to, go to someone internal, not to you. You're sitting on some desk somewhere and you need to get your data. So, um, Dean Kerr and I, have been systematically meeting with the dean, with the directors of nursing from the local hospitals about giving us access. Forget the VA. Um, the VA is a federal system. They have a federal role. So I, I'm just going back on that door. Probably. <laughs> it's important for every, everyone across their whole system where you need an inside person to sponsor this. Progress is furthest along at Metro. Okay. Um, they've created uh, a new category called um, Bioscientist. Okay. So, and this is, comes from their privileging, like they privilege physicians to have certain types of privilege. So they're going to have a privileging status called Bioscientist. Okay. And so we will be able to, but Privileging is not an easy process if you've ever been privileged somewhere. Um, it, it's a lot of work. It's the fingerprints thing. It's the, you know, um, this much to fill out kind of thing. So I'm going through that process now. I'm almost done. Um, you also go through all the training to do research at that place, which I, I'd expected. It was the privileging tactic that kind of blew me away. And the, the many, many um, inoculations. <laughs> Um, and I didn't even have a project. This is, this is like an exercise for me. Um, so um, I just want you to say that I'll be the first, but then I think we should follow with a few more so that we start building, you know, um, seeing how this works. And that sort of so what does this mean? Like, do you get epic access? Do you get yep. posting? I mean, how, how much do you get? So you go through before you get out. Pardon? Like, what, what do you, how does it help you versus having? Well, I can go in. It's me. It stuff comes to me directly about the IRB. Someone else, if someone else doesn't do it, um, I can control my personnel there right now at Metro. 
personnel have to be hired by them? You know? So I mean, it's it's a will a will a case employee if you're the bioscientist certified okay. credentialed at Metro, and you want to hire a case employee as your research assistant, you can do that. They'll let them have access. There's going to be a certain level of training they'll need. Um, but it's not going to be, they're, they're, they're going to accept that the PI takes responsibility. Okay. So, you know, I mean, you're going to have a lot of responsibility, but you do that now. Okay. <coughs> so that's going to be your main site if you work it. Right. You know, that's where you're going to go. Yeah. And we're going to do more, more multi site stuff. We have to get some kind of credentialing as researchers. Yeah, but you're not, right. not nearly as in depth. Someone else is still right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, part of it is just an acknowledgement. And the door opened there first because I found out they had engineers. Because first they were saying, oh, you have to be a physician you know, with privilege. And I found out there were engineers. So that opened the door. And their categories is biosciences. So that's, that's why I, I didn't choose that. How is that process working? I'm going to get to them last because that's the sad story right now. Okay. Um, university mm -hmm. hospitals, Kathy Koppelman is working with their privileging people now. We found out that that was the way to go in. Okay, it wasn't going to happen much in the other way. And um, she's very interested in language and stuff that's working out at Metro. And, um, it's kind of interesting how they all want to now, you know, be, and they should because we're doing research and they're magnet hospitals and that sort of thing. But I think we're not too far from UH us being able to go in as PIs um, there. I, I, mean, I mean, don't we have people who've gone in as nurse PIs there without being UH employees? You have to be credentialed. Yeah. I, mean, I still have to go through my department, like making a bar app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When yeah, you put the IRB in, you have to have someone from there. So not as the PI No, they want they want either a letter or something that says you have legitimate access. You're but credential to the department. I'm credential to yeah. ID. You would be credential to right. medical care. We want to credential you to here. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, all these places have, you know, some things. They would like nursing research committee, and I had a long discussion. I don't want my protocol held up in the nursing research committee for four months, okay, after NIH has approved my protocol and everything, and then you're suggesting that I add a variable or something, you know. And they seem very, the, the directors of nursing seem very sensitive to that and are, you know, going to figure out a way. They believe that it's more a communication that this is going to occur and to look at resource um, assistance or, you know, that sort of thing, <laughs> rather than a science review. At least at Metro and UH. And I think, we, again, we're, we're trying to make a headway here on this. Um, the clinic, all right, right now has a policy, nobody outside the clinic can do research there. No matter who you are, what you did, who you linked up with, you cannot do that. We have some meetings coming up. I mean, they said, well, again, you can't. Um, so, uh, and we'd like to do some multi-site, you know, stuff in the city, and that's a huge lab for, for all of us. Um, so, I, um, uh, I'm hopeful that we will make headways. I can't figure out how high that goes in the institution, or if it's actually a fairly um, person, just a gatekeeper, you know, lower down, who's, who's said we can't. So, surely just a little bit of background on that. In the last couple of years, the clinic has all nursing activity under nursing units, including uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Naples, Florida, Vegas, all nursing reports up to specialized So, thank you, my department. I just released a research conduct. Um, have all the 
you become invisible? Well, I, I don't care about that group per se. Um, but I, for, the, for this discussion, though, it is important because it is a discussion we have to have. With the reason why we've chosen to transform this bypass research that it takes two or three months to be able to look at the protocols, regardless of your background, we've also done the study that this person has done research. So, when you put in an IRB, then it very clearly says you are an RN, regardless of who you report to, Nancy Albert has to be on the protocol on your side. That's your meeting with them. Well, you know that, but it's nursing control and nursing activities at all levels to account for. And that's a huge, huge barrier. get to the IRB if you've gone through the nursing one, they are really tough because they're worried about nurses latching to inside. Yeah. So, I haven't uh, had that experience there. So, I mean, I get to address it. So, so my last trial, I did, Cleveland Clinic was one of my sites. Yeah. I went in through cardiac rehab, the physician who was my clinic. I had to go and sit in his office to use the system to load the IRB in. I had to go big for the reports and okay, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I did research there, that sort of thing. Uh, so you can see why they're kind of going to be a, a, a bummer. On the other hand, I know the clinic will. If they, when they click over, it's a fast click. They can be extremely nimble suddenly. Okay, and a policy change. Slightly kind of tedious. So I think there's multiple levels of gatekeeping. I think the best strategy now is to continue with Metro and UH, kind of make it embarrassing not to open your doors to one of the best research places in the country. I'm specifically committed to public health and wellness I don't know how they're handling the hub reliance of the nurses. I'll bet when it gets to the clinic. So, you know, the reliance is when you do, it, it's kind of a, a yeah, generic, a generic um, IRB application that you fill out, and then you say which one will be first, and the others are supposed to really expedite it through that. But it's kind of, not, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, that would be an interesting way to slip across the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think they're smarter than that. <laughs> Any other questions people have? I just thought I would keep you in on the loop of where we are in that, because we all live this, you know, getting asked out. Anything else? All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Carol. Could you send this your slides? They're going to be posted. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. I'll send you a link. Here, okay. Here, okay. We'll send you the link. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to Where are we posting the list? I don't remember. In, it was the gold bag? Or, or under the research.